Thanks for tuning in. Today I'd like to show you some of the tools and some of the parts I use when I restore and or repair vintage audio equipment. So stay tuned and I hope you enjoy it. If you enjoy vintage audio equipment and you've come to the right spot, please subscribe and hit that notification bell as well as giving me a big thumbs up if you like this video and share it with others. First I'd like to show you how I go about organizing the parts. In my case I work on so many pieces of equipment I have all the capacitors and all the transistors I need to do practically any project. The only thing I don't have in stock would be the filter capacitors because there's so many different diameters and values um, and they're expensive. You know the filter capacitors are, are expensive so but anything besides those I have in stock and I organize them the way I do into bags. Um, it just works for me. Now I understand you guys out there they only have one unit you're thinking about doing. Uh, you don't need all these parts and you're gonna have to go in that particular unit and see what you need. You're gonna have to see the values that are needed, how many you need, etc. Um, you should always have the service manual and if you have the service manual it will have a parts list in it. But that parts list is not always a hundred percent. And I will tell you just from experience uh, when I first started out I tried to order just the parts for one unit and inevitably you order a hundred parts what's going to happen you know you're going to forget a couple um, something you thought was one thing is another and you're going to get your parts and you're still missing something and so it's pretty frustrating to have it ripped apart and not be able to do anything with it until you get those other parts that you need and that's another reason why I keep a supply it's just so nice it, it doesn't matter the unit I can bring in any unit and just start working on it because I know I've got the parts for it and I just threw a few bags up here I, this is probably oh I don't know you know this is maybe 10% of what I have um, you know here's some film capacitors um, sometimes I all use those where small electrolytic capacitors would go in the signal path I've got every brand you can think of um, you know here's a bag uh, this one's uh, Nishnikon uh, KL series 1500 volt here's Elna audio capacitors you may have seen me talk about audio capacitors. Well, here's a bag full of them. You know, even transistor insulators and transistors themselves. Here's two very popular uh, signal tra transistors that are used, KSA 1845s. And notice I take a big marker because like I bought these from Mauser, as you can kind of tell there, but it's real hard. You know, the part number is on there, but it's a lot easier whenever I get something I, I write in a big marker what it is and also the date I got it. Uh, transistors, we're not so concerned about dates, are we? Those should last you, you know, practically forever. But uh, I do put it on all the capacitors too, because in capacitors case, I want to be using those fresh ones, right? I don't want to have capacitors sitting around here for five years that I finally get to. But this is a KSA 992, a very popular transistor. Uh, this is a bag of looks like a hundred and this here you can kind of see a roll in there kind of the transistors in there and this must be a bag of, I'd say that's 200 and that's usually how I buy them I buy them a hundred at a time 200 at a time because I use them so much so anyway I just wanted to talk a little bit about that part before I show you uh, the equipment that I use whenever a cover is removed from any vintage equipment there's a shock hazard this is why there's cautions on the cases. If you don't feel comfortable working on vintage audio equipment, please don't and consult a professional. To do vintage audio repair, you need a good soldering iron first. Um, I've had this Hako 808 for many years. Uh, it works great. Um, there's a lot of good brands of soldering irons out there, but get a good soldering iron. I'm telling you, Without that, um, you know, you're going to have difficulty working on this stuff. You're going to be using that all the time, every single part you replace, and for other reasons too, but you've got to have a good soldering iron. 
Um, this one I bought several years ago. It cost me, I don't know, at the time probably 60, 70 bucks. As I said, they don't make them any longer. Uh, they make a new, they have a new model that's a digital uh, one Hako makes that's similar to this one. But it's going to run you 100 bucks. Just is. And any good iron is going to be up in that range. Another tool I could not do without is the is my Hako 808. Again, they no longer make this tool. They make another tool, a uh, desoldering tool is what this is. And I'm telling you, if you do any any amount of work at all, this is a tool that you're, you'll be so glad that you've got. And I'm going to demonstrate uh, this tool and to show you that, um, you know, this is something that maybe that you can do when you've got the proper tools. Um, you know, any of you guys out there that are mechanics, tools. You guys write software? Tools. I mean, having the proper tools to do anything is, is just makes it so much easier and makes your, uh, you know, your chance of success uh, so much better. So let me get started with this and, uh, you know, just show you how it works. See if you can see, I get this turned right. Um, we're going to be changing out... Uh, there's a 100 microfarad 35 volt. I don't know if you can see that or not. Maybe. You can probably see these better. These are 470 microfarad 50 volt. Um, you can tell electrolytic capacitor, they're always marked. The bigger ones, it's easier to see. There's this black line and these minus signs with an arrow pointing down. On the other side, all electrolytics have two leads will be the positive side. So you can see here, if you can see my finger, maybe you can, and I can wiggle this 100 microfarad 35 volt capacitor. Okay, I'm going to flip this over. Uh, this is a JVC, I think I mentioned, uh, an equalizer. And it's a good size unit to just show you um, what you're going to deal with when you're doing your unit. Um, I'm going to flip her over to the artwork side, which is where we got to go to get the components out. Right? We got to get the soldering iron on there so these guys will come out here. Um, over time, you'll learn kind of how these components are in here, and you think, well, there's a lot of choices, and there are, but you kind of learn over time where the configuration of them, where they'll probably be. This is that one large capacitor. The other one's over here. Um, that one that we're going to take out first, um, as you may have recalled, there was a couple resistors here, so I'm thinking it's these two right here these two pins here. And I also want to uh, tell you, before you pull any of these out, even though the artwork on these boards are usually correct, the stenciling, every now and then they're wrong. So just make sure you know where the negative lead is. It doesn't matter what the stenciling says. If, it, if there, you want to reinstall these electrolytics just like it shows. So we'll go ahead and I'm gonna take this smaller guy, this 100 microfarad, 35 volt guy out first. And I hope you can see this. I think maybe what I can see of the camera there. Maybe you can see this. First, what you ought to do, this is, you don't have to do this, but it'll help get these guys out of here. Is what you want to do is just flow that solder again. So I think we said this was one capacitor, the large one. This is a large one. This here, there were a couple resistors, and then it should be this guy here. So I'm just going to flow a little bit of new solder. And this is going to help the desolderer get those out. And in this guy's case, I can get my finger under here. And it's, it's easier again when you're desoldering. If you can move that a little bit, that'll help. So here's the desoldering tool. You can see the end of it. It's that Hacko 808 I showed you. And this has a little vacuum in it. You can probably hear that. And it's going to heat the solder up, and then it's going to suck it out of that hole, hopefully, for us. 
So let me get on there. I don't know if you can see those holes, but they're not too bad, but they were bent under to hold on. So what we've got here, this guy here is, is loose and so is he actually. They're both actually loose. So what we can do, just bend this straight. If you wanna cut it off, I don't know if you can see that moving, you can. If you wanna just pull it on through, you can. This one's got a little more solder left. So I can see it there on the end, but I think he'll just pull right out. I'm moving this, I hope you can see it. And now I got my hand under the unit, and now this guy's gonna fall right out. And there he is in my hand. So we've got him. He's a 135. You can see that, but this does such a better, such a much better clean job. Um, you have a lot less chance of harming those little eyelets using that tool. Instead of, you might see some people using one of these manual guys. Oh man, you know, if you just have one to do, maybe two or three, maybe. But I don't know if you can see that section. It has a little lever here. And I'm gonna try to show you. You push the lever in, it locks, and then you got a button up here. And the idea would have been to heat that with your iron, and then with your other hand, suck that solder out. Well, it, I'm telling you, uh, if you ever have a desoldering gun, uh, you'll never use that again. And I had to look to find that, and I've actually got another one, a bigger one. Also, another thing people use are, is solder wick. Again, get in this hole, heat that wick up, and it'll suck the it'll suck the solder right out and onto this onto this wick so you can pull it. But you can see what we just did was a heck of a lot simpler, wasn't it? If you can see that, I don't know that you can, maybe you can, maybe you cannot, but there's a plus sign over here and the negative goes there. So we orientate it the same way as the other one came out and we push it down in. This guy feels pretty solid. Um, I don't know, I think I can just solder him in. And you can notice the leads are quite long uh, and we'll have to take care of that. But let's just solder him back in. I'm trying to reach under my light here so that makes it a little bit more difficult. I'm trying to show you this. I wouldn't normally have it orientated quite like this, but there we go. Um, we got him in. Just give it a, a couple seconds for the solder to cool down. Really, you're good to go now. And just trim it just above. You know, you can you can kind of see the other ones. You know, just trim it up above. You don't want to get down in the solder, but you don't want to have a, a two inch piece of lead hanging out either. So there's that guy. If you were if you were doing this. Uh, on, on this particular equalizer, right, we've got some more electrolytics here, some more up at the front. Um, you know, this would be the same as if you were doing it, uh, you know, with your piece of equipment. So um, it's just repeating over and over the same thing. So there you go. You just want to check your work, make sure that um, everything looks good. And uh, really, you just continue on like that and just do a component at a time. It's not a great idea um, to just take all these out at once. Uh, you know, take one out, replace one, go to the next one. Once you do that, um, you know, vintage equipment will be able to run for decades more. And uh, there's no reason uh, this unit or any others, once it's uh, been, had those old electrolytics taken out of it, there's really no reason why, uh, you know, it can't last uh, another 20 years anyway, maybe longer. And uh, the next guy can work on it and keep it going. Okay, I hope this... I hope this video was informative for you. Um, I just wanted to show you a little bit about it. Now, if you, if you guys are gonna, somebody there was gonna try this, um, you know, I, I'd recommend, it's like anything, you know, it, it takes some practice, it takes some time. So work on something, you know, like I'm working on. You know, you can practice on something like this before you get your uh, Marantz 2600 for your first project. That would not be recommended or anything that's really important to you because there are 
you know, a, there is a chance that you can make mistakes. I make mistakes. I still make them. So, you know, you want to feel comfortable doing this, but you can see how important a good soldering iron and a solder removal tool will help. Once again, trying to use some kind of plunger tool like this guy here, or trying to use solder wick like this stuff here, it's just gonna make the job a lot harder. You know, it, it just is. And, and as I said before, you guys out there, that whatever you do for a living or whatever you're good at, you understand uh, how important tools are, whether you're working on a car or, or you write software. So I hope, again, that this really uh, helped you out. You found it informative. And um, if, you, if you did like it, please leave me a like down below. And um, if you'd like to see more videos like this, I would appreciate a subscription. <laughs>